Hello, everyone, or hello again, if you've been with us for, for part of the day or most of the day. Uh, welcome to our fourth session at ISNTD Climate and Health, uh, the conference where we're trying to bring together the sectors of climate change and public health, focusing on neglected tropical diseases and infectious diseases. Um, and it's been really a wonderful day so far. So there's been so much food for thought and lots of um, opportunities for exploring these collaborations across the two sectors, a lot of discussions on some of the gaps, uh, but we're hopeful. We heard from modeling colleagues, we heard from programmatic colleagues. Um, so it's been a really, really great day. And uh, to kind of around this, to kind of round off this first day where we're looking at the evidence base for these linkages, we thought what a better way than to really drill down to um, those diseases that we're most concerned with here at the International Society for Neglected Tropical Diseases. And that's precisely the neglected tropical diseases. So I'm really excited about this panel. Uh, we've got four speakers who've joined us live here and who will be taking us through some very exciting research on several aspects of the impact of climate on a specific disease or a specific uh, condition around neglected tropical diseases. We'll be hearing from about Chagas disease, schistosomiasis, uh, mosquito-borne diseases, and also uh, very interestingly, surgical care for NTDs. And how does climate impact these and how, how do we fit this all together? So without any further delay, um, I'd like you to join me in welcoming very warmly our speakers. We'll be hearing uh, first and foremost from Dr. Christine Giesen. Hello, Christine. Hello. You're uh, representing the Centro de Salud Internacional, Madrid Salud. Uh, and as the name suggests, you're tuning in from Madrid. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, we'll you. be hearing also from Professor Giulio De Leo. Hello, Giulio, and welcome. Great to see you guys. Nice to see you as well. Uh, Julia, you are um, joining us from Stanford University where, um, oops, sorry, where you are a professor in the Department of Earth Systems and Department of Oceans at the Stanford Durr School of Sustainability. So thank you so much. And we'll be hearing from you about climate change and schistosomiasis. A very warm welcome as well to Hugh Shirley from the Harvard Medical School. Hello, Hugh. Hi. Good morning to you. And you'll be talking to us about the connection between climate change, surgical care and NTDs. And um, to talk to us about Chagas disease, flooding, climate change and poverty and that whole kind of nexus. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Teresa Patricia Faria from the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Thank Hello, you. everybody. Hello. Thank you for the invitation. So, um, as I said, really excited for this session and without any further delay, I'm going to hand over the floor to you, Christine, and we'll, we're going to hear all about mosquito-borne uh, diseases in Africa and climate change. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Hello, everybody. And today I'm going to talk about my research topic, which is the impact of climate change on mosquito-borne diseases in Africa. And, well, I think... I think that so far we all know that climate change impacts both directly and indirectly on human health. And today I'm going to focus on changes in vector ecology. We know that the impact of climate change on mosquito-borne diseases still raises some controversy and debate because many important processes are not usually taken into account when, when dealing with this issue. And therefore, we believe that in an integrating vision of all the factors that um, of the of the transmission transmission cycle, such as vectors, reservoir hosts, but also the interactions between them, is really necessary to fully understand the the dynamics and also the epidemiology of these diseases in in Africa. We chose Africa because. Uh, research has shown that low and middle income countries are among the most uh, most severely affected um, countries in the world by climate change. And there, there is not much research in this area in, in Africa. So that's why we focused on this on this region. 
Well, we performed some systematic reviews um, following the PRISMA guidelines about these topics, and I'm going to introduce some of the results of, the, of the, our main outcomes to you. So the first systematic review aimed at, at assessing the impact of climate change on mosquito-borne diseases in Africa. And we included uh, 29, a total number of 29 studies, of which six dealt with the, analyzed this, um, this issue, the impact of climate change on mosquito-borne diseases from a global approach and four from a continental approach. Although those that dealt with then analyzed specific countries uh, mainly analyzed Eastern African countries such as Ethiopia, Tanzania, and also Kenya and Uganda, but some also analyzed Western African and Sahel countries such as Senegal, Mali, Niger, and Benin. And only one study addressed the issue in Southern Africa, specifically in South Africa. The most frequently analyzed disease was malaria, although dengue, chica, thikungunya, and also, and also Rift Valley fever and West Nile virus were also addressed in some studies. And we observed that the most frequently analyzed environmental factors were temperature and also precipitation patterns, changes in precipitation patterns. Uh, although several studies analyzed more than one, uh, than one single environmental factor, and I would like to highlight that only eight of all the included studies analyzed the net effect of climate change on these, di on these diseases. According to 72% of all the studies that we included in our research, um, there is a, cl an, a clear impact of climate change on mosquito-borne diseases in Africa, whereas 21% 21 showed no impact of climate change and 7% showed unclear results. In terms of prevalence, um, according to 69%, mosquito-borne disease prevalence will increase in Africa as a result of a changing climate, whereas 17% seven, whereas showed, no, showed rather a decrease and 14% showed no changes or the results were unclear. We observe that prevalence will mainly increase in Eastern Africa in terms of malaria in, in countries such as Ethiopia, Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi, although, although there were also contradictory results in some, in some of these Eastern African countries, mainly in Tanzania and Kenya. And malaria will also increase in Mali, Benin, and Niger. Whereas Rift Valley fever and West Nile virus disease will also increase in, in parts of Western and Southern Africa. And curiously, Zika will increase in South Sudan. And the future climate change scenarios, expansion, the expansion of these diseases will also increase according to 69% of the studies and will decrease according to 17%. And the spread will mainly affect malaria in, in the Sahel region, like Niger and, Niger and Mali, but also Benin and Rwanda and Burundi. And in other Eastern African countries, there were contradictory results. So we don't really know if, if malaria will increase or decrease, or there will be no changes at all in, in these countries. Zika will also increase and spread in in South Sudan, whereas there were no changes um, registered in Rift Valley fever and West Nile virus disease in Senegal and, and South Africa. Now, as, uh, those studies that analyze specifically um, one of all of the diseases show that malaria will, there is a clear impact on malaria transmission in previously naive mountain regions of Eastern Africa, although there will also be a possible, possible increase in, in prevalence and expansion, but we already saw that the, that the results were rather contradictory. Dengue, which was analyzed only in four papers, will expand towards Southern and Central Africa in those countries that, um, well, in those papers that analyze it from a continental view, as well as West Nile and Chikungunya. Rift Valley fever will expand towards northeastern Tanzania, and Zika will expand towards South Sudan on the future climate change scenarios. Another paper that we that we another review that we that we performed analyzed the impact of environmental factors on West Nile virus disease in the European Union and also in the Mediterranean region because we saw that no 
that no paper of the previously analyzed um, showed any increases or in in northern Africa. So that's why we changed our search terms, and because maybe climate change is a very uh, very broad term. So we saw that that the short distance to bird settlements will ha has positive is has a positive re is positively related with cool eggs vector abundance in in Egypt. And in terms of non of non human dead and hosts, mainly horses for West Nile virus in in northern Africa, we we saw that vegetation is a positive predictor for for non human West Nile virus incidents as well as precipitation in Morocco. For human West Nile virus incidents, we saw that we saw that the presence of water bodies such as wetlands and also a short distance to bird settlements is a positive predictor for human West Nile virus incidents in in Algeria and Tunisia, as well as vegetation in Tunisia. Whereas humidity is negatively related to human West Nile virus incidents, um, and well, we believe that we also observed that that there is a clear expansion of West Nile virus to in regions in southeastern Europe due to a change in climate, whereas there is a big uncertainty about North Africa and the Middle East and also about the different West Nile virus lineages. And of course, our, our studies have some limitations, mainly publication and selection bias and also the different quality and variability between studies. And I would also like to highlight that there's a, we observed the difficulty in correctly defining climate change because many, many studies analyze loose climatic variables without, without analyzing the net effect of climate change. So take home messages. Most articles conclude that climate change has an impact on mosquito borne diseases in Africa. Although the results are very partial because, well, they only analyze part of the whole spectrum of what climate change is also from the, of the disease because maybe only vectors were analyzed, but not human incidents, et cetera. And only few studies really address climate change and mosquito borne diseases in Africa. And most studies focus on malaria. And we have also seen that there are a lot of that um, most countries were in Eastern Africa, so we don't really know what's happening like in, throughout the whole continent and what's happening also with the, with the other diseases. So we, we recommend to continue investigating this issue from a holistic and transnational approach because well, vectors, for example, they don't know of borders. So, so it's really important to, to adopt a comprehensive approach and also to manage the same concept of climate change. Well, just uh, part of these of these pro of these reviews were funded by the European Union Horizon 2020 project, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine, and uh, really, really interesting to hear not just your findings but also the the many gaps that remain and in conjunction with Ayman Ahmed's uh, presentation earlier on today about invasive mosquitoes. Uh, it'd be really interesting to see in future all those knowledge gaps uh, filled in terms of climate and mosquito-borne diseases across Africa. So thank you so much. We're going to jump to something quite different now, which is schistosomiasis. But uh, I think w during our discussions, we, we can all come back together and really discuss uh, the practicalities about doing climate and NTD research. So there will be a link there. But if for the time being, thank you, Christine, and I'll hand over to Julio for Fantastic. a presentation. Thank you very much. So hello, everybody. It's great to see you. It's an honor to be here today in this panel with my distinguished colleagues. I want to start with something that is probably kind of obvious at this point of the day or at this point where we are, we are entering the Earth greenhouse effect in way that are totally unprecedented basically in the last million year. We know the global temperatures have increased already by over 1.2 Celsius degree. And we believe that this is a reason of concerns for a wide range of diseases. And uh, I would say the vast majority of the parasitic diseases and a large fraction of the so-called neglected tropical diseases. All these diseases, including the malaria, the dengue uh, that uh, my colleagues just talked about, 
share these really important features. They have an important environmental component in their transmission cycle. And so we expect that climate change in its multiple dimension is going to affect either the parasites free living stages or their non-human host. I specifically work a lot on schistosomiasis. Schistosomiasis is probably uh, one of the most important of the so-called neglected tropical diseases is present in uh, uh, four continents in 74 countries, uh, affect uh, uh, basically 200 million people, 800 million people at risk. And this specific uh, parasitic disease is a very interesting life cycle. So it, the life cycles include an obligate intermediate host, which happen to be freshwater snails of very specific species. And so basically <clears throat> the people get infected when they step into contaminated water where there are these free living stages, the cercaria, and infected people release eggs that in contact with the water hatches and these free living stages, the mutacidia, swim around and find eventually snails that they got infected. Now what actually happened is that with free living, free, free basically uh, stages of the transmission cycle being ectotherms, being unable to thermoregulate, uh, climate change and temperature, of course, is going to have a huge importance. So what I want to look here is the effect of climate change and schistosomiasis over three different points. The direct effect of temperature on parasites and snail, which is the most obvious one. But I also want to bring attention to other aspects that somehow were referred to in my previous talk. It is the effect of human response to climate change and what is the effect on transmission risk for schistosomiasis <clears throat> and also the climate change effects on disease risk that are mediated by uh, a wider ecological community where the parasite is embedded in. So let me go to the first point, <clears throat> just uh, to mention that uh, uh, um, uh, thermal performances curve are would say been derived to describe the metabolic, the physiological or demographic response of both the parasites and the snail <coughs> to temperature. <coughs> With this data, it's possible for us to identify the critical thermal thresholds, that is minimum temperature, uh, which for instance, uh, the cercaria are able to swim and the maximum temperature at which they are able to, switch, uh, to swim as well. Now, when we consider the basic uh, critical thermal limit, uh, we can start to do some really basic but super powerful exercise as Anna-Sophie Stensgren did, for instance, this seminal paper on a review on the schistosomiasis climate change in 2019. She basically identified the mean temperature of the coldest quarter, one of the bioclimatic variables, and the mean temperature of the warmest quarter, and uh, identify the threshold, the maximum thermal threshold for the maximum temperature of the warmest quarter and the minimum temperature for the warmer one. Then from the NTD data sets, she got the location of all the places where we know that schistosomiasis is occurring and plotted there this bioclimatic variable for the two most important species that are schistosoma hematobium and schistosoma mansoni. And as you can see, basically, schistosoma can only transmit in this lower quadrant there, where the temperature is not too high and neither too low when it is cold. The threshold catch really well the maximum thermal tolerance of these two parasites, less well the minimum one because the snails are able also to <clears throat> hibernate, so to speak, and to, to survive uh, the winter digging into the map. And so even where temperature is very low during the winter, they might still be able <clears throat> to basically resume their life cycle and transmit schistosomiasis. What Anna Sophistemus did, she took all these places, she projected what minimum and thermal, uh, minimum temperature of the coldest quarter and the maximum temperature of the warmest quarter is going to be at the end of the century. And as we see, everything translates <coughs> towards the upper right. And the very interesting thing is that there's gonna be a bunch of places that were presently too cold for the transmission of schistosomiasis that are gonna move into the envelope where transmission may occur. But there's gonna be also a lot of places 
in which the temperature was already at the limit and potentially in the future would be too hot to support the schistosomal transmission. In a paper in 2011, Stemsgard, for instance, uh, did uh, a, a statistical analysis, basically looking at correlation between temperature and the parasite, and identified areas where schisto is expected to increase all the green area where schistosomiasis is expected not to change dramatically, and blue areas, especially in the tropical area, in the tropical region, where temperature might exceed the maximum thermal tolerance for schistosomiasis. An alternative approach is the one used for instance by Gwen et al. Uh, in a paper in 2021, in which they got uh, the life cycle of schisto, they develop uh, a thermal sensitive uh, mathematical model of schistosomiasis transmission in which they got every single parameter for which data are available <clears throat> and recasted the parameter as a function of temperature. For instance, this is the data that LL published in 1974 about the relationship between snail egg productions and temperature. So they did it systematically for all the demographic and epidemiological parameters that are reported, for instance, here in these figures, so snail mortality, Miracidia mortality, Sercaria mortality, and so on and so forth. And they basically clamp this together by computing the basic reproduction number, which is a measure of the transmission potential, if you want, of the disease, to uh, look at and, and identify what is the thermal envelope and also the basically thermal optimum. In this specific paper, for instance, thermal optimum is 21.7 Celsius degree, which according to my personal experience and a lot of available data, seems uh, a little bit too low from what we think that optimal thermal temperature might actually occur. And this is might depend upon the type of data that has been used to parameterize the model. And in fact, I just want to mention there are uh, lots of different studies, um, something like more than a hundred that report tendently an increase in uh, schistosomiasis transmissions, in some cases uncertainties, and a small number of cases in these tropical areas where they're actually projecting a decrease in schistosomiasis transmission. So multiple different point of view. Let me briefly go to my last two points. One is the effect of uh, people response to climate change. And here, what I want to mention is that as a consequence of the increasing frequency of drought and the uh, heat wave and the reduction in precipitation, we expect to see, and we are already observing climate migration and crowding around windy water. And also the other element that is very important that one of the most significant and important response to uh, the drought and the need for water is the construction of dam and water management infrastructure. This is part of a general uh, process, basically, and trend that is happening. Climate change and population growth are basically putting pressure on the production, for instance, of food for feeding a growing humanity. And because of that, we are developing more artificial reservoirs. Now, there is an overwhelming difference of a relationship between agriculture, dams, and increase of schistosomiasis. A classic book, uh, one of the seminal um, um, review by Peter Steinman that has been shown systematically in this process. This is what actually has been observed, for instance, in Senegal, uh, in the lower basin of the Senegal River at the border with Mauritania, where as a consequence of the construction of, uh, of the Jama Dam in 1985, there has been a, an upsurge of schistosomiasis that we probably have, you know, have seen never in this level and this proportion. And here, I won't get into the details, but I want to say that the community and my group specifically has published a series of paper that showing what is the cascading sequence of the event, the construction of dam lead to an increase of schistosomiasis. And the problem, and I finish the second point here is this one, to say that uh, there are, are uh, basically hundreds of medium-sized dams that are projected to be built in Africa and in South America where there are pockets of schistosomiasis transmission and probably thousands of small reservoirs to support cattle and to support agricultural productions. And so we identify this as one of the critical areas that needs to be investigated. And I have a single slide only on my last point, 
uh, that is about the wider ecological community. And I mentioned this specifically because in my simplified cartoon, I have people and one snail that are involved in the transmission of the schistosoma parasites. But when we focus, for instance, just to mention one place in Brazil, we do actually have 10 Bionfinaria species. That, uh, of which only three, Glabrata, Tenagophila, and Straminea, are supposedly involved in the transmission of schistosomiasis. And these species might compete among each other, so they might respond in different way to the challenges provided by climate change. And this is, remains a big area of investigation in which we need to know more. In conclusion, what I want to say is that we generally expect an increase in schistosomiasis transmission risk, especially at the cooler fringes, at the cooler margin of its distribution where temperature was too low so far and my potential increase. There is going to be the potential decreasing transmission risk in the Optus region, although this might compound with behavioral aspects, for instance, of the snails, for which it's not totally clear whether this is what is going to pan out. As was mentioned in, my pre in the previous talk, it's not just temperature. Climate change is not just temperature. The rainfall and flooding, the drought and heat waves, all of them are going to affect a different species of snails in different way. And there is this compound effect of climate change and land use change and change in demography and migration that might also uh, change the basically outlook of the risk for schistosomiasis. And last but not least, this problem will identify the thermal physiology across <coughs> different schistosoma parasites and species for which very little data is available. And with this, I want to thank you all and to you know, my wide range of collaborators and uh, the agencies and donors that made this research possible. So thank you very much. Let me gather back the um, ear if I can find you and stop sharing the screen. What a fantastic presentation, Julio. That was uh, very sobering, actually, that uh, thinking about schistosomiasis, of course, there's a huge climate element, but uh, there's so much more beyond that. Uh, a lot of these, uh, it's not just climate, not just temperatures, as you said, but also a lot of issues around land use, migration, uh, and we can come back to those very shortly. But thank you very much for kind of broadening that out to that. We're moving now to something slightly different, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Hugh Shirley, who's going to be talking to us about another aspect of neglected tropical diseases and climate, and that's the connection between climate change, surgical care, and NTDs. Great, thank Hugh, you very much. Look forward to this. Thank you very much, and over to you. I'm just gonna start the, the presentation here. Um, thank you again for having me here today. It's such an honor to be amongst um, such a great group of speakers and presentations. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Hugh. I'm a medical student at Harvard. And today I'm going to be talking to you about the critical role for surgical care in the conversation that we're already having about NTDs and climate change. And I hope during the course of, of my talk, I can kind of not focus on a specific disease, but rather a modality for care for those diseases and uh, convince you that it's an important part of this conversation. I have no disclosures. I'm a penniless med student. Um, to give an overview of the talk here, um, first I'll briefly frame the problem. Um, then I'll talk about surgical systems and bring in a couple specific examples of NTDs where this is relevant, namely trachoma and lymphatic filariasis. And then I'll talk about next steps. So to frame the problem, other speakers have already spoken about this, and I'm sure it came up earlier today. Um, climate change is impacting human health. NTDs are subject to the impacts of climate change, uh, whether through shifting epidemiology or through disruption in our standard programming to control the spread of NTDs. And surgical care uh, is an important, important treatment modality for several of the NTDs. To talk a little bit more about shifting epidemiology, the last, uh, the last two presentations spoke about this as well, but um, we'll see changes in NTD epidemiology due to differing environmental conditions, droughts, flooding, human migration and urbanization, as was mentioned before. And then of course, because of disruptions in um, water, sanitation and hygiene programs, 
as well as mass drug administrations, and lastly, and the focus for today, um, interruptions in surgical care. So to introduce the idea of surgical systems, um, a lot of the global surgery work really kicked off in 2015 with the publication of the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery, as well as with the D Disease Control Priorities 3 publication, which focused specifically on uh, the surgical burden of disease. And these two documents, along with several other really seminal publications at this time, made the argument for the cost effectiveness of surgical care around the world, especially in low and middle income countries where the preconceived notion was that surgical care was too expensive to provide. Um, they really highlighted uh, that surgical care was just as cost effective as some of the standard um, global health, public health interventions that have become um, part of our everyday toolkit. And uh, specifically relevant to this conversation, in low and middle income countries, um, greater than 200,000 of the surgical procedures that are performed there are typically performed by international medical missions rather than by local surgical staff. And that becomes particularly relevant when we think about the burden that climate change will play on access to surgical care due to interruptions in access to, um, to low and middle income countries by medical missions. And it really speaks more broadly to the argument that I'm making about the development of local surgical infrastructure to help mitigate disruptions um, at a global scale. So now onto surgery and specifically its role as a unique modality in NTD care. Typically it's indicated for late stage disease. So these are severe uh, disabling presentations of certain neglected tropical diseases where pharmacologic intervention likely will not help. Um, so it's really important for um, reducing the burden of disease in those cases. Uh, surgical expertise alongside climate change needs to shift in order to um, address how NTD burden is expected to change over time. Um, as other speakers have mentioned, uh, you know, we're expecting shifting epidemiology for certain NTDs and in order to proactively prepare for the surgical burden associated with certain diseases, we need to make sure that surgical expertise is present in those locations in order to um, reduce the burden of disease. And lastly, surgical care requires not just a surgeon, um, it's a team sport and requires anesthesia, nursing personnel, sterile equipment, um, as well as an operating room. Um, so there's a lot of infrastructure that goes into providing surgical care and thinking about how to develop that infrastructure in order to prepare uh, locales that haven't experienced the surgical burden of NTDs is important to address the issue as soon as it becomes um, uh, prevalent. So this is a, a table from a paper that I published with a group out of Brigham and Women's Hospital that looks at NTDs with surgical burden of disease. Um, the two that I'll be focusing on uh, for the rest of the talk are trachoma and lymphatic filariasis which are up at the top, but we also uh, went through several other NTDs that have known surgical indications. And we briefly mentioned, um, not in great detail, but the, the role that climate change will have on the prevalence and transmission of these diseases. <clears throat> so first to talk about trachoma, um, just some basic microbio. It's spread, spread by chlamydia trachomatis, or it's caused by chlamydia trachomatis. It's the number one infectious cause of blindness affecting around 2 million people worldwide. Um, it's uh, endemic um, in 45 countries and exposes greater than 100 million people to disease. Um, and we've made a lot of progress on tr controlling trachoma over the last several years. This uh, chart on the left demonstrates the scaling up of um, our epidemiologic understanding of the burden of trachoma in the red line. Um, and then in the blue line, we see uh, a scaling up of mass drug administration programming. And relevant to, to this discussion is how MDAs experienced a, a sharp decrease during the COVID pandemic um, demonstrated by the blue line. And it's these kinds of interruptions that um, invite the opportunity for um, the surgical burden of disease to, to rise. So thinking about how um, events like COVID-19, which have climate change links, will affect the burden of surgical disease is, is very important. 
to talk a little bit about the actual surgical condition associated with trachoma. Trachomatous trachiasis is an interning of the upper eyelid um, that's caused by repeated um, uh, exposure to the pathogen and inflammation of the, of the eyelid. Um, it can cause blindness due to scraping of the cornea by the eyelashes. And there's a surgical procedure, this BTLS, um, uh, that, can, that can correct the condition. This is one of several surgical procedures that does it. Um, the most recent data is that there's a backlog of around 2 million cases of trachomatous trachiasis that need, that need surgical intervention. Um, and a lot of uh, areas where um, uh, this disease is prevalent likely depend on medical missions in order to uh, uh, get access to surgical care. So disruptions in those medical missions um, in the absence of local surgical capacity can, can really delay access to care and lead to um, more severe sequelae of the disease. Um, and as I mentioned before, disruptions in MDAs and mapping can lead to the potential for re-emergence of disease in areas that had previously been, been cleared. Next, I'm going to mention lymphatic filariasis. Um, it's a mosquito spread disease caused by filarial parasites and uh, over 800 million people live in endemic areas and over 50 million people are currently infected. And of those 50 million, around 25 million men are estimated to be living with um, panscrotal lymphedema and filarial hydrocele, which is the actual surgical indication for, for this disease. And notably, we've seen a slight increase in the number of people living in areas that were not covered by MDAs uh, during the COVID pandemic. Um, to touch on hydrocele, they're an important cause of disability in, in countries where lymphatic filariasis is, is prevalent. Um, the required uh, surgical correction of hydrocele's uh, procedure called a hydrocelectomy is required for definitive treatment. You can't just drain the hydrocele, otherwise it will recur. You actually need to surgically remove the cystic structure. Um, and we've seen that the cost effectiveness for this procedure is, is similar to hernia repair and vaccination and about 10 times more cost effective than antiretroviral therapy for HIV. Um, alongside the statistic that I showed about MDA administrations, we've also seen an increase in the number of patients um, that we currently know of that have hydrocele that are waiting surgical intervention. So now to talk a little bit about next steps. Um, it's important to include surgical care into ongoing conversations about our NTD programming, and this can be done at the national and multinational level. At the national level, it can be done through NSOPs, which are national surgical obstetrics and anesthesia plans, which really build in surgical care into a universal health care uh, coverage framework. Um, secondly, recognition of the vulnerability of our current programming to climate change in order to highlight the need for local surgical capacity building um, is, is a core focus. And lastly, increasing research into the, the surgical burden of neglect of tropical diseases is always essential. Uh, better understanding the surgical workforce and how to best deliver care to areas where NTDs are endemic. Um, and also adding surgical indicators to monitor the progress for NTDs for which they may be relevant. So lastly, just my key takeaways for this talk, if you, if you leave here without anything else, my, my main point is that surgical care is cost effective in low and middle income countries. Surgical care for neglected tropical diseases is an important modality for improving quality of life. And lastly, surgical care should be included in conversations about adapting NTD programming to the impacts of climate change. So I think I'm probably right at my 10 minutes, but thank you again for, for listening and thank you for having me at this, um, at this conference. Thank you so much, Hugh, and uh, just for outlining that. And also, quite importantly, something that's been missing today, we've talked a lot about climate and diseases, but less so about climate and the healthcare sector and um, how those two interplay, how the healthcare sector can really uh, also manage and minimize climate impact. So it's been really good to open that up in the discussions. Thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to hand over uh, to Teresa. Um, Teresa Feria, you're joining us from the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, and you'll be talking to us about uh, climate change and particularly uh, its consequence in terms of flooding 
and what this means for Chagas disease and poverty in a more general sense. So, P Teresa, over to you. Thanks for joining us. And while we give you a few minutes to put your slides up, I thought it would be a good time, actually. I haven't taken a moment. We've just kind of dived into the material to say hello to our lovely audience who've been actually quite active on the chat. Um, everyone's been saying great presentations to our speakers, and that, of course, I will totally agree with. Uh, we have Belisa Ismail here tuning in from Haramaya University in Ethiopia. Hello, Belisa. Kishore Wasan, uh, who will be speaking tomorrow in our Extreme Climate Events uh, panel. And what can the public um, health sector do to mitigate these? Uh, Lahiro Kadituwaku, thank you for the comprehensive presentation. Christine Tamar Orabi's joined us. Pierre Fongosu. Uh, from Cameroon, Rachel Golan from Nala in Israel. So lots of colleagues around the world. Really nice to see everybody. Uh, and please do go ahead and post any questions or comments, maybe something from your own experience uh, in the chat. We do already have a few questions building up and we'll, we'll bring those in. Looking forward to our discussion in a few moments. But in the meantime, I'll hand the floor over to Teresa and uh, we'll regroup in a few more minutes. So thank you, Teresa. Over to you. So we are here to talk about very important topics. And thank you very much for, for the invitation and for all the audience to join in us today. So my topic is related to an area that um, I would like you to know and get more familiar with this map. It's basically the United States, Mexico, and this is the border. The border is a, a share a lot of beautiful things we share culture, language, um, uh, and, uh, food, uh, amazing things. And of course, the river that is the geographic barrier here, where we come from Mexico and cross the United States and vice versa, either by cars, walking, we bring pets, we bring food. There is a, um, an amazing uh, turnover of people over, uh, during the day. As we share all these beautiful things, we also share a legacy of infectious diseases. And that is what I'm just taking a, a little um, a information of what we have in Chagas disease. Chagas disease that is carried, uh, I'm sorry, that uh, the parasite is uh, carried by chetomine bugs, also known as kissing bugs or chinches besuconas in Spanish. So we have a, about 11 species in the United States. And here in the valley, in the lower Rio Grande Valley and Mexico, that is that area that I shared with you earlier, we have three different species, Gerstacheri, Triatoma Gerstacheri, Triatoma lenticulara, and Triatoma sanguisuga. The most abundant is uh, the first one, Triatoma Gerstacheri. And uh, just to briefly talk uh, or remind us about what happened, the kissing bug is going to get the blood meal. It's attracted by the carbon dioxide, same like mosquitoes, right, to the host, get the blood meal. And at the same time, it poops. In this species is when the parasite come, we help the parasite to enter to the circulatory system. When we scratch early in the morning, it, uh, this uh, uh, Chagas disease might be uh, passing from acute to chronic phases when the disease is basically not detectable. And here is what, what the danger. This is a map that was uh, showing, and this is an old map of all the cases of human cases um, known of uh, Chagas disease uh, through um, blood um, testing. And in the case of Texas, Chagas disease was not reportable until 2014. And one more time, we are in this area here in the border with Mexico and the United States. Uh, Chagas disease, there is no cure as we know. There is a treatment, but it's also uh, um, difficult to get. And we have other issues going on in the border. Here are representing human cases by zip code. The green colors represent, and the red uh, circles represent kissing box that we have um, gotten either going to the field or people um, 
uh, sending the box to our labs. The yellow is the river, and we have Mexico, and we have Texas in this size. So we don't have human cases in Mexico. This is just based on the map that I showed you earlier. And all the dots that are in, in red are kissing box that we got that tested positive to have the parasite, the presence of the parasite. And uh, those are the kind of settings, the areas, this uh, uh, Hidalgo and Cameron County in southern Texas, border with Mexico, are the areas with very, very low income, are the poorest areas that we have also areas known as colonias that don't have the drainage, don't have the um, infrastructure that other residential areas. It's important for me to mention this because when people Im imagine the United States, they always think that, uh, or they might think that we don't have these kind of conditions. And in the Southern area of the United States, Northern areas of Mexico, we have a lot of high poverty. So the great conditions for the insects to, 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 to go in the houses. We uh, have collected insects, as I mentioned, or we also got insects from people, and we run tests in the um, in all these uh, insects. From 100%, 100 insects, 50% chances that the uh, kissing bug might carry the parasite exist here in this area. So not going to show too much graphs and, and numbers. What I want to show more is that because we know that we have the poverty, we have the change in precipitation, temperature, other conditions, people migrating from one side to another. But another detail that I want to mention is that uh, because health uh, care might be expensive or some people might not have it, people from Texas might travel to Mexico to get to see the doctor. So if they might have or uh, happen to have Chagas disease, we might not know in the United States. So this is information that might not be um, uh, available. So the number of cases of Chagas or autochthonous Chagas might not necessarily be always reflected just because that the crossing of people going to Mexico is cheaper. And also there is a lot of better understanding in Mexico side about Chagas disease, just telling that in the case of Texas, we started reporting in 2014. So we have the poverty, we have the people that already had uh, as the, the diagnosed with Chagas, we have the kissing box and 50% chances that you see one kissing box uh, that has the parasite. And we wanted to see what will happen with climate change. So we use, and this is uh, an old paper, we are running models, and I had to say thank you very much to this conference because my colleagues in UT uh, uh, Austin, Dr. Katrin Brown, saw the advertisement from the Welcome Trust uh, um, program, and we got the grant to do more modeling and work with local communities, and I'm going to talk more about that, or we will talk more about that, hopefully with results next year if possible. So what you see here, the dots, the, the red dots, is the presence of the kissing bug. And this is the geographic area, Mexico and the United States, when we run the, the models. All what you see in red areas are the suitable habitat, those temperature precipitations are good, and um, different variables that are good for the kissing bug to try to drive, so to, to survive. So with different scenarios in different years, uh, at this specific uh, time, those all are very old now. So just want to show we did this exercise. In all of them, we have suitable habitat for this uh, kissing bug, triatoma, gestacere, that is the most abundant to exist here in the valley. So we have everything. We have everything for Chagas disease to keep being a, a potential burden here in the area where we live. We did survey also on people about the knowledge or perception of knowledge that they have with Dr. Ravi that is here with us too. We did this with the students uh, um, and the local community. 80% of the participants out of 351 participants did not know or were unaware that the kissing bug exists and that they can carry the disease. So they might not uh, uh, report that. In addition to that, flooding facts, I mean, uh, it's happening here in the valley, it happened a lot. So sometimes it's just rain per hour, sometimes it's day, days of uh, raining. 
and we have these consequences of flooding, urban flooding a lot. So we have um, then a cascade of, uh, or a synergy of different factors going on here in the valley uh, and uh, the border with the United States. And all these areas, uh, urban and semi-urban, that can be great reservoirs for the rodents, for the kissing box, and one more time for the humans. So checking below your bed is not enough to prevent um, uh, the Chagas disease. But it will help a lot when people know more about that. And when we are aware, we can follow the practices uh, in Mexico. And we can, of course, do more surveillance here that we are doing now. And um, one example that I have about the surveillance between these two areas, Mexico and the United States, is a binational uh, surveillance that we did with the mosquitoes. And it was a great, great collaboration where we actually um, learned a lot from both sides. And something else that we do uh, a lot here is uh, community engagement. We work with the local community, with the students, with people around to keep clean the areas, the back yards, the front yards, the, a lot of problems we have with the tires, everything that can be reservoirs, I mean, uh, uh, micro habitats for the insects to, to um to, to live, to, to drive, to lay eggs, we are trying to, to work at different levels. So basically that was my short, hopefully um, uh, timely, um, and I respect the time of the presentation, but I wanted to, to share with you that um, we have all conditions here for this disease and we are working on that, but it's more we still have more work to do. So I'm very happy to share with you these uh, settings to talk uh, about what we are doing, what we can do, and all what you are doing. Thank you very much for this opportunity. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my presentation. And I will uh, go back to you, Marianne. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Teresa. And thank you to all our speakers, actually. Um, Kingford, Kingford Chifwembe says this about the Hughes um, presentation that uh, they have been eye-opening, but I think that applies to all of these presentations uh, today on, on these numerous and varied diseases. Um, and really so much to think about when uh, bringing in climate impact into NTD and public health uh, investigations. So thank you so much for that. Uh, what really strikes me actually is that for many of you, uh, this is not just what you do. You are uh, really prolific researchers in lots of different fields and aspects of um, tropical diseases or public health. Um, Hugh, you're a medical student. And so uh, just kind of starting the discussion a bit broadly, I was very curious to ask, um, how did, as health people, shall I say, how did you start to bring in uh, climate change into your work? What, why did you do this? And uh, what was your experience with that sort of, what were the main hurdles? Or did you think it was a kind of a very natural step to take? And I'm really asking this question because I'm assuming that a lot of the people connecting today uh, aren't so versed across both sectors. We do have lots of climate colleagues tuning in, a lot of um, public health and NTD colleagues tuning in, of course, and I think they'd really value to hear a bit more about how did you go come about uh, to work on the climate impact onto diseases. Um, I'll probably just go in order of the presentation. So, Christine, perhaps you would like to start? Well, I'm. Thank you for your for your question. And yes, well, I'm. I'm a public health specialist. So, and we also deal with like with environmental health. So that's why I decided to go a little bit further and to see. I mean, I mean, Spain is in Europe. I think. <laughs> Julia. Well, I'm a disease ecologist. I, I, I actually got a master in in environmental engineering. In the first place, I've been always interested. In, in problem of sustainability by and large, but then I took a deep dive into ecology, population ecology and disease ecology, and eventually got interested in working else in human disease. I certainly want to credit that I had a fantastic series of collaborators at the top of which there is Dr. Sokolov, who is the person who brought me into the Schistosomiasis work, and I will always thankful for 
uh, introducing me to um, such a complex system and uh, a series of other great collaborators. So I think it's the, it's the community and my experience of work also uh, that brought me in the lower region of the Senegal River and understanding the reality uh, and uh, the, the importance uh, of the work that we do well beyond you know, the publication of games and other things. And so that's just what makes me extremely passionate and make me want to wake up in the morning and work on this. Fabulous. Yeah, I, uh, to answer your question, uh, I'm relatively early in my career, and so I haven't had the opportunity to generate such a circuitous path to, to this interest. Um, but I primarily arrived at it because um, uh, there's a, a group called the Program for Global Surgery and Social Change where people are thinking about global surgery. And there's a specific focus within that organization where we're talking about climate change and surgical care generally. And so I am interested in uniting that interest, that focus with um, what I came to medical school with, which was experience in the Leishmaniases and, and studying those, which is something that I did prior to medical school. And so that's how I arrived sort of at this this intersection of neglected tropical diseases and, and climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I, I teach a university that was mainly teaching university. Now we are moving to research university. We are first teaching, then emerging, then uh, we are R2. But I'm teaching for most uh, pre, um, bio majors. Pre-med, when we started this line of vector borne diseases, I said, okay, so we need to have like a more uh, focus here. And then um, my interest for that kept just growing with, I, uh, uh, with what I was discovering there. But my field of study is global, global change ecology in general. Although I was a, a studying in invasive species or um, endangered species, it was uh, thanks to these great uh, motivated students that brought that to my attention. So we start a whole line and we have more than one decade now of uh, doing work on different vector borne diseases with different aspects. Thank you very much. It's a great question. That, that's really interesting. Thank you, everyone, to kind of put that in, uh, in context. Uh, there's been some few really great questions here from our audience, and uh, please don't be shy if anyone else wants to add to that. Uh, go ahead. We've got a question from Edith Nwanko, who first starts talking about mosquitoes, and I'm assuming this uh, is aimed at Christine. I, I do see you've had an exchange, but not everyone's on the chat, so I thought I'll just open it up here for a few minutes. Um, what informed your focus on temperature and precipitation as the major climatic or ecological factors that you evaluated affecting the population dynamic of mosquitoes? How would other factors such as conductivity, oxygen level, pH affect those vectors as well? And uh, Edith says the same question really applies to uh, snail intermediate hosts and schistosomes. And I guess we could open up that question to, to all the researchers here. You know, how do you select for um, what you want to focus on in terms of looking at climate impact on diseases that you study? And how do you go about bringing out those, uh, those variables rather than others? Christine, I guess. Oh, yes. <laughs> Well, so I start first. Uh, well, thank you very much for for your question. It's it's really, I mean, um, you're right. I mean, um, unfortunately, we saw that most studies only focus on temperature and and precipitation patterns. It's not so much that we chose only temperature, but most studies um, addressing climate change they don't go further. They just like say, okay, temperature and precipitation. That's reality. And well, m the most frequently analyzed factors in, in all the studies that we read were temperature and precipitation, although there, there were also others like, um, like humidity, also sunshine, but it's really, it would be really interesting to like focus on all these different variables. So thank mm -hmm. you very much. Julia, over to you. Yeah. Um it is, I think it's an excellent question. Generally, it does apply to uh, the schisto world as well. Uh, we know that P 
pH is important. We know that uh, oxygen is relevant. We know that water quality is uh, relevant as well. And also, the, in general, the type of soil, for instance. And uh, I think that, you know, from my point of view, it's not only cherry picking, but looking at the literature, the broader community, what they have found. And uh, the second problem I would say sometimes is really what is the scale at which you want to work? Because uh, there are some projections that for obvious reason we tend to do a fairly broad scale. And sometimes that information might not be available. There is no doubt that climate change projection is off the shelf type of projection that you can get and easily, so to speak, apply to your model. So that's the first things where you want to go. And uh, at that scale, sometimes temperature envelope does really you know, play a huge role. But when you zoom down, it's important to consider all the other elements that might be there. For instance, I briefly mentioned in my talk about the behavioral response of snails to temperature. When we look, for instance, in a river or in a lake, uh, even though the surface temperature might be too high for the snail, to uh, basically uh, either you know survive or be uh, you know physiologically effective, the snails have some capacity to dive down into cooler water during uh, the peak hour of temperature. So there are these different you know aspects that really depend partially upon the scale, the type of question, and what is available. And I think that it was mentioned also before that. Even you know the human side, the socioeconomic drivers. I think everybody here talk mostly about disease of poverty and how poverty is a powerful driver because make people constantly exposed to disease anthropogenically and uh, how it's going to be the agricultural landscape uh, of Africa or South America in you know, 50 years from now. That is a really difficult question to answer. Um, Hugh, I guess this question uh, applies in a slightly different way to your work. Um, but again, I mean, just looking at the links between surgery and uh, climate change and NTDs and the how health sectors can contribute, how 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 did you choose to include the variables that you came across and and which ones did you not? And perhaps um, building on what Christine, and Julio have said as well, there's also perhaps quite simply the limitation of uh, the lack of data when you, you would want to include certain um, variables, but if the time series, the data aren't there regularly and consistently, that, that can also in itself sort of limit the scope of the work, but sorry. Um, yeah, to, I, to, to address your question, um, you're totally right. I think lack of data is a huge issue. I think it's especially an issue because when we're trying to collect data about the surgical burden of disease, it's the very dis climate disasters that we're talking about that can make it difficult to measure these conditions and, and measure these indications. And so um, just thinking about that as we're, we're trying to build capacity for um, understanding the, the burden of disease, but also build capacity for treating the, the conditions themselves is, is really important. Um, I'll just echo what I've heard others say already. Um, I think human factors are, are a really important part of how climate change will influence uh, neglected tropical diseases, whether it be through migration and the introduction of, of, um, of the pathogen to locales that might not have had exposure before or the introduction of vectors for, for those pathogens as well as conflict, human conflict, which is a driver of, of surgical burden of disease, but also will disrupt um, standard NTD programming. Um, the other point that I, I wanted to be sure to make was about, um, about how, how scaling up surgical infrastructure not only um, benefits the, the surgical burden of NTDs, but also benefits the surgical burden of other diseases that we don't typically consider NTDs, but nevertheless have have important climate. Thank you. Teresa, would you like to add to this? I'm so sorry, you've gone back to mute. That is my, my thank you very much. I think this is a great question. It's a great question. And we have also to look at, for one side, we don't have all the variables. For the other side, 
if we add a lot of more variables, we might end up with multi-collinearity or correlation of variables that might not inform much if you, uh, 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 depending on what we are doing, for example, uh, potential distribution of a species due to climate change. So we might, uh, if we have um, ideally all what, 20, 30 variables, might some of them have some kind of correlation. So we also want to avoid, eliminate some of those others. Is like, yes, we would like to learn more about the physiology of the species to, to actually add this information into that. So I think this is a great question. And, and we still, and several people still exploring which remote sensing, which other kind of variables are uh, gonna be helping us to predict. The most important is, in my case, see, that we can have solutions on the ground, short term, to, mm -hmm. to help mitigate, adapt, or uh, prevent, control the diseases so with actions in, in uh, with the communities. But thank you, thank you, it's a great question. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Teresa, because that links quite nicely to another question about um, you're mentioning sort of impact and uptake uh, on the ground. And so I just wanted to ask all of you what in your uh, perception, and it links to a question here as well, asked by the audience, in terms of going from your research to policy or influencing decision making, whether it be on a municipal level or, you know, COP 27 is coming up, who knows? Um, but we heard all day long and all the way from the opening speech by um, the WHO, the head of um, climate and health at WHO, that what we really need to focus on is more research, more evidence. And here you are, you're like, you're like the panel who's doing it. Um, and so how do you feel about how your work is, uh, has the potential to influence governments and policy? Um, the question that's been asked by Edith was referring specifically to um, how agricultural practices and the construction of dams with that incredible slide that you showed us, Julio, and how would that have a direct link with schistosomiasis? But I think that question could be opened up much more widely to, to each of your um, fields. How, how strongly do you feel and what are the bottlenecks to your work really having that impact in terms of policy and communities? Over to you, Christine. I'm just sticking to presentation order again, but you know, I don't always mean to, to make okay. you go first. Well, thank you very much. It's a very good question, actually. And well, uh, as I mentioned, one of our research topics was funded by the European Union. So I hope that at least it will like provide um, some evidence. Uh, it's specifically the, the work we've been doing about West Nile virus because, well, West Nile virus is considered um, uh, emerging disease now in the European Union. So I hope that, well, and we've seen that, for example, in Spain, we had like the biggest West Nile virus outbreak like ever, but it wasn't really in the news because because we had so much COVID. But um, still, it's it's important like to adapt. And also we've seen that, for example, birds, migrating birds don't migrate anymore because because of a change in climate. So I I hope well, I really hope that our research will like at least provide the, the, the evidence to to, for example, in some places put in practice, I don't know, mitigation practices or Seriously, wonder myself, you know, how avoid to get trapped in the ivory tower of the academic world. Uh, and so, you know, one way is try to work on connecting the dots between knowledge to solution. And so try to understand how some of our basic research might lead also to certain type of intervention uh, that might change the trajectory for some of these reasons. So there's been certainly a commitment, a choice uh, to uh, work on what, you know, we also define as user-inspired research on questions that are related to pressing needs for our humanity. Then in the terms of really changing trajectory, uh, I've been working also on uh, two additional aspects. One is the institutional one, is trying to understand what are the levers, what are the points where 
we can exert an effect that is much stronger than just the pressure that I put there. And uh, for me, uh, there have been certainly one way more recently, about uh, six months, eight years ago, I got more involved in the Global Schistosomesis Alliance, which I think uh, is uh, an amazing group of uh, scientists, practitioners, and people in the decision-making process. And uh, I find uh, they are increasingly the intellectual energy uh, and that electricity to try you know, to connect and to spearhead is uh, much wider than scientific papers per se published on, you know, on, on peer-reviewed journals. And so we've been working in this specific area to, for instance, um, draft and write papers that will be delivered uh, to the Ministry of uh, Water or the Ministry of Agriculture, for instance, to think about the connection about agricultural expansion, intensification, and uh, schistosomiasis. And so that is another element that, you know, my work in, in my specific area. Uh, another aspect that I think is important, which is back to the issues of solution, is that, uh, you know, bringing the problem on, you know, up uh, the attention of uh, the public is certainly one step, and we definitely have to do that, but we really have to offer some solutions. So one thing that we are currently doing, for instance, we've been analyzing the environmental impact statement of uh, the big dams uh, in Africa and in other places to look whether there has been any attention, especially when there are uh, international financing from the World Bank or the African Development Bank in both ER in, in the construction, whether there is any attention to schistosomiasis. It's lamentably, I have to say that attention is pretty uh, modest. It's very, uh, you know, in some studies it's not even mentioned, in other studies it's mentioned, but there is no really indication of what needs to be done. And so what I'm doing now, I'm developing a so-called decision support tools that basically allow to easily map risk for schistosomiasis associated with the development of water management infrastructure on the table of decision makers. I not want to tell them what they should do absolutely, but I want to tell, we do have the tools now to understand whether that is going to be a risk or not. And maybe that's up to you and the Global Schistosomiasis Alliance to, prevent, to present you with the menu of intervention if the risk is there. But you, can't, you cannot tell me any longer that you didn't know or how could I know who reads the scientific paper. We need to increase capacity and attention and inspire the new generation of leaders of tomorrow. Honestly, we love your enthusiasm, Giulio. Um, I think you... You said uh, at the start of your presentation, oh, maybe we don't need to go over this. Uh, it was those two very kind of simple slides to remind everyone that it is literally a climate catastrophe. And I, I sort of feel I'm a bit guilty of that, for example, throughout this day, kind of thinking about models and papers and so forth. But actually, you're right. This is actually an emergency. Uh, that's certainly the view that we take at ICENTD, and it's not necessarily up for debate and um yeah it it does get lost sometimes in uh in in the discussions in between public health infrastructure governments municipalities but this is what we're facing so it's really great to hear that from you thank you um Hugh you're over to you yeah uh thank you for grounding us in that that important reality um to answer your question, what are the, the bottlenecks of, of having impact uh, on the ground? Um, so I think I, I touched on this a little bit in my my presentation, which is that, um, you know, national surgical obstetric and anesthesia plans can really be a tool to um, improve capacity and drive intervention on the ground. So that requires, of course, buy-in at the national level. And unfortunately, it's not a um, one-size-fits-all kind of strategy, and you, you definitely need to have those kinds of conversations with stakeholders, um, those different conversations with different stakeholders in different countries um, to make sure that the, the, the policy intervention that you're implementing actually addresses the burden of disease. Um, and then beyond the, the policy level, I think on the grounds capacity building is the most important thing. Developing the surgical infrastructure, developing the personnel, 
and then of course developing the the understanding that um, these diseases can be treated with surgical interventions. Um, I think those those kinds of interventions are the, the most important in having an actual impact um, and are often very difficult to achieve. Thank you so much. Um, I think Teresa had to go, so she uh, sort of um, left the webinar very, very rapidly there, but uh, so we won't be able to hear her views on this. But thank you so much um, to, to the three of you. As Kishore Wasan saying, excellent points, absolutely. Um, we just have a few more minutes left, and so I think you've really um, inspired a lot of our attendees in many ways and from your very varied perspectives. But um, what I think a lot of people will have joined today for, particularly from the public health side, is perhaps to get a better understanding of where they could start if they wanted to bring in uh, uh, climate considerations into their work. And so You've done quite a long stretch of the journey compared to, to some of us. And so what would be your parting words or your advice to anyone who wants to really get a bit more involved in that sense? So what, what would you, whether it's from the view of your particular disease that you're working on or just in general as public health professional or depending on your backgrounds, what would you recommend? Christine, well, over to you. I start. <laughs> well, as I already mentioned, I think it's really important to to well to adopt transnational approaches because well I'm I'm talking about mosquito borne diseases and a mosquito doesn't know like oh here's a border like here here's Morocco and on this side is Algeria I'm not going to fly over this border so it's if there is if one country is affected like it's likely that also the neighboring countries will also be affected um sooner or later so so it's not only a problem of some certain regions in the world it's it's really a global problem and so i think that's that's the most important message like i would like people to take to to take on that this is like this affects everybody the cycle of mosquito borne diseases and of course to well try to do well try to stop climate change <laughs> so thank you very much thank you yeah, that, Juliet, yeah, that, that, final that, advice yeah that's a really good point i mean maybe i mean the, you know the the lesson here is really stop climate change you know and uh, just just thank you for mentioning that christina i think in fact that you know there are specific calls that i can make about uh, you know schistosomiasis and other neglected tropical diseases that unfortunately affect billions of people uh, around the world. So they are neglected, you know, these parasitic diseases, but also as uh, Hugh was mentioning before, you know, they are affecting a large number of people and some type of intervention would be tremendously cost-effective. Uh, you had that slide in which you were saying the cost of trillions and half a billion, you know, would per se help to improve the quality of the people and i think for those who look only to dollars that you know might be you know even you know something super powerful thank you for uh putting that on the, my last point if i may because we're talking to such a wide uh, audience and i do not exactly who's there i would say find your call right i mean you can either be an undergraduate student or uh, an early career researcher or somebody working in a public health institution in your own country uh, or, you know, whatever it is, I'm sure that you do have the capacity with your to make the difference, to bring this problem to the attention of those who count in your specific world. And so to me, that is, I mean, it's, it's not true. You, you can't do anything, each of us, as some capacity uh, in order to, to try to change something in the process from your own choices, in fact, to stop a climate change, what you do, or from the things you do in your own institution or the research choices. Yeah, to, to answer this really important question, I guess I have two thoughts. Um, I did put that, uh, you know, economic statistic on my my slide. And I, I did that because that's the world in which we live. But I think that this 
bigger issue isn't necessarily it's not a problem of economics it's a problem of ethics and it's a problem of energy we have we have the tools to solve this problem and it requires that we recognize the the human the human right to a healthy environment and a, a right to health um around the world and to, to answer your specific question about um how to infuse this into work i think you know this is a a a tremendous issue that will touch on every aspect of everyone's lives. It's the healthcare issue of our, our generation, of our era. Um, there are myriad ways that the work that you do will connect to climate change. And it just takes um, a moment to, to stop and think about. I'm head of climate and health at WHO did confirm that uh, tackling and reversing climate change will pay for itself. So that's that taken care of. Um, but in the meantime, all your it's just been wonderful to learn about how and what different colleagues are doing in different diseases in different regions. I'm really sorry we couldn't get uh, uh, Richu on uh, for malaria in India. So um, maybe we can have a separate mini session with her in future. We do run our weekly ICENTD Connect sessions, which I hope everyone uh, will come and join. I think I recognize many names from our other uh, events, but um, also just to confirm to everyone who's been asking, we, we are recording the session, so that will be available on our YouTube channel. If you want, if there's any parts that you missed or you wanted to hear again, uh, that will all be there. Um, but anyway, just to wrap up this really amazing and interesting day, um, we need more research. Uh, we've heard from a lot of colleagues how to do this. Um, we've also heard about very complex and useful decision-making modeling tools. Um, there's a lot there. And as I said in my introduction at the start of the day, particularly the neglected tropical disease community, which is concerned with the world's most vulnerable, is a really important stakeholder, we believe, in the climate tackling climate change and so we really hope to see a lot more of those synergies uh, moving forward so thank you so much to everybody who contributed to this first day tomorrow there's three more sessions so we'll be talking about partnerships uh, we're also going to be looking at how the NTD community can help in the response to extreme climate events and also um, uh, in a more kind of uh, methodological way, how to bring uh, more climate uh, issues into public health, whether it be uh, courses or the sector uh, or at the municipal level, really looking at, we talk a lot about breaking the silos, but what does that mean and how do you do that really in practical sense? So a lot more material tomorrow. I hope to see you there. Have a good evening, everybody, in the meantime. Uh, my head's spinning now, lots of great thoughts, and a huge thank you, particularly to the speakers in this session. It's been absolutely eye-opening and really amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you.